Hello guys, how are you all, welcome to my channel, so, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto becomes the new god of war, part 1 subscribe if you enjoy the video, let's start the story. It was a normal day in Konoha, as the sun rose in the sky, waking many, as it cast its glow across the land. One of those who awoke was Naruto Uzumaki, academy student, and Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, the demon that attacked the village 15 years ago, raising the age, as kids fighting life or death battles is stupid, many lives were lost in the struggle. One such life was that of Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage, as his death came in the only way that could stop the fox, by sealing it into his only son, Naruto. The technique, the Reaper Death Seal, was capable of sealing anything, even the fox, but at the cost of life of the one performing the, as the was also a summoning. The being that is summoned is none other than the Reaper, the Death God himself, and once the seal is complete, he takes his price, the soul of the one who summoned him. Even with such a powerful seal, the fox could not be contained by a simple object or an adult, its chakra would corrode the vessel or simply break out. As such, the vessel must be a child, with its umbilical cord freshly cut, as its chakra coils could adapt to the fox's chakra. And while the fourth Hokage's wish for his son to be seen as a hero was a last request, it was sadly disrespected, for the grief of the lives lost turned to anger among the villagers, and one Saratobi Hiruzen, the reinstated third Hokage, revealed what happened. The tears of the crowd turned to death threats, directed at the child who never knew, who never even committed a sin, but was treated as murder. But despite the glares and death threats, Naruto pushed them aside, never giving in to the hate that surrounded him. And while Naruto acted a fool for everyone in the village to see, he certainly wasn't, as he knew what the seal on his stomach was and what it held. It didn't take much to figure out, as the curses included fox brat, demon spawn, and other such things. Shaking his head and rubbing his eyes of the last of the Sandman sand, Naruto spotted the calendar near his bed and smirked, well what do you know, guess it's time I stop messing around, hopefully it won't be the Bunshin clone again this year. That damn is the only one I can't do out of the three, oh well. Donning his usual orange jumpsuit for the last time, he mentally added, he went to his cabinet in the kitchen, pulled out a cup of instant ramen, then set the kettle for it to boil. After the kettle started to whistle and the ramen cooked, he started to think, I still don't get it, why me, why must it have been me? I know I will never get an answer, but, still. Seeing his breakfast ready, Naruto slurped up the noodles and headed out the door toward the academy, not knowing of the events to come. Ninja Academy Front Gate. At the entrance to the school stood a girl, her eyes darting all over the street, as if looking for something or someone. Her dark blue hair fell down her back, reaching her butt, her dark blue pants reaching her ankles, with tape covering them. She also wore a black undershirt over a fishnet shirt, all of this topped off with a large jacket, hiding the shirt, as well as her cup breasts. The jacket was grey in the top half, while dark blue in the bottom half. This girl was Hinata Hayuga, heiress to the Hayuga clan, and one of the few in the village to show Naruto any emotion besides anger, in fact, it was well known that she was in love with a boy, though she did try to hide it. As she looked down the road leading to the gate of the school, she saw Naruto walking toward her, a calm expression on his usually happy-go-lucky exterior. As he approached, she said, more like stuttering, I won't write it, just imagine she is, good morning Naruto-kun, are you ready for the test? Naruto looked at her, and in a voice that was as calm as the expression on his face, said, as long as it's not the bunshin technique again, I'm sure I'll do just fine, but, he holds out his hand, shall we head inside? Anada blushes at the action, not knowing how to respond, but quickly nods her head and walks next to Naruto on their way inside to the classroom. Ninja Academy Aruka's Classroom. The classroom was filled with voices of the Genin hopefuls as they each eagerly awaited the test and the future as Shinobi. Among them were some of the soon-to-be rookie nine. First, there was a boy sleeping in the back of the room. He wore a brown short sleeve vest over a fishnet undershirt, dark brown pants, and blue Shinobi sandals. His brown hair was pulled back, resembling a pineapple. His name was Shikamaru Nara, heir to the Nara clan, Kanoha's shadow users. Sitting next to him, eating what looked like his fourth bag of chips this half hour, was a fa-I mean chubby kid, wearing a green jacket, a grey shirt with a kanji for eat on the front, blue pants, and blue sandals. His name was Choji Akamichi, heir to the Akamichi clan, Kanoha's giants. Sitting near the back of the room was a rather stoic boy, his hair similar to an afro, looks that way to me, he wore a large jacket, which covered most of his body, it blocked his mouth from view, and the sleeves came down to his half his hand, his round sunglasses hiding his eyes. He wore brown pants and had the standard blue sandals. His name was Shino Aburam, heir to the Aburam clan, wielders of the insect contract. Sitting in another part of the room was a loud boy who seemed to be talking to his pet dog. He wore a brown jacket with fur on the hood of it. He wore brown pants, along with the standard sandals. 
His name was Kiba Inuzuka, heir to the Inuzuka clan, a clan famous for their feral nature, as well as their partnership with Ninkin, ninja dogs. His partner was Akamaru, a dog wolf mixed breed. Sitting in the far corner of the room was a raven-haired boy, his face seemingly in a perpetual scowl, as if it were set in stone. He wore a baggy blue shirt with a high collar, gray arm warmers with blue bands at the ends of them. He wore white shorts that came to his knees, white tape wrapped around his ankles, and blue ninja sandals. The sign of his clan, a white and red fan, was on the back of his shirt. His name was Sasuke Uchiha, the last loyal Uchiha, a clan that once was the police force of the village, until it was destroyed by Sasuke's older brother, Itachi Uchiha, yet no one knows why he did it, but he did. Not far behind him sat two girls, one with blonde hair and the other had pink hair. The blonde wore a rather revealing outfit as she wore a purple skirt that came down to her knees and a purple sleeveless top with Sarashi covering what the outfit didn't. Her name was Ino Yamanaka of the Yamanaka clan, Kanoha's mind walkers. The girl with pink hair wore a red battle dress with black biker shorts underneath. Her hair fell past her shoulders with a red ribbon holding her hair up. She was Sakura Hirano, the only one who wasn't from an actual clan. This was the sight Naruto and Hinata walked into as they saw that their fellow classmates were just as excited as they were. Not wanting to sit next to the King of Brood, Naruto asked, mind if I sit next to you today, Hinata-chan. Hinata, still not trusting her voice due to the suffix, simply nodded her head. After they sat down to wait for their teacher, Kiba looked up and saw the two sitting together, something he didn't like. He walked over to where they were sitting and had a look of utmost contempt, which he voiced, Hey dog, get the hell away from her, she's my woman, not yours. Naruto merely looked at Kiba from the corner of his eye, not even turning his head, and with his voice still, as calm as ever, said, she's yours. Last I checked dog breath, Hinata-chan was a human being, not owned by anyone, and I clearly don't see your name on her anywhere, so I guess you are talking like what you reek of, straight shit. The entire class froze, even Aruka, the instructor, who had just walked in, stopped in his tracks. The entire room was silent until Choji found his voice and said, oh damn, Naruto played the shit out of him. That got the entire class roaring with laughter, even Sasuke was rolling on the floor, which made some people who saw this either stare, fangirls, or run to the window to see if the end of the world was at hand. Tiba on the other hand, was pissed at the remark and in his anger, tried to punch Naruto, regardless of the fact that Hinata was close by. Seeing this, Naruto got up and in a fluid motion that most, but the people right next to him couldn't catch, he grabbed Kiba's fist, pushed it out the way with his left hand, and with his right, was about to deliver a knife strike, but stopped before he hit the chest. And quickly delivered a punch to same spot, one. Kiba flew back to his seat, clearly knocked out. The class was silent again until Shikamaru got up, walked next to Kiba's seat, and said, damn, you got knocked the fuck out. Too. He then went back to his seat and to sleep. Aruka merely stood there wide-eyed as he never heard Naruto speak that way, nor Shikamaru, deciding to skip to the test, he said, alright, we will begin with a short written test, then go outside for the T-A-I-J-O-O-T-S-U hand-to-hand portion. And then come back inside for the N-I-N-J-O-O-T-S-U ninja art exam. He sees Mizuki walk in with the test papers, Mizuki will hand each of you your tests, you have 30 minutes, begin. Naruto looked down at his test and saw that it was different from the one Hinata received, and while he knew his skill in G-E-N-J-O-O-T-S-U illusions was poor, he knew how to detect and dispel one. Placing his hands in the ram seal, Naruto muttered, K-A-I release, so no one would hear it as the illusion disappeared, revealing the real paper test with each question one that Naruto answered easily. 25 mins. Later. Aruka called for time, Mizuki going around to collect the tests to be graded. Haruka led the students outside while he explained the test. The Tajutsu test is one-on-one, -on -one, with a score determined by how well you do, not by if you win. It will be known in Jutsu or weapons of any kind, if you are knocked out of the ring, it is an automatic loss. When I call your name, you can pick your opponent, but it can't be someone who has already gone, the same goes for the ones picked by a student. Up first, Sasuke Ichiha. As Sasuke walked into the circle, he knew who he would pick as his opponent. When Haruka asked, who will you be going against? Sasuke responded, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto, who was sitting next to Hinata under a tree, got up with a sigh and walked to the circle, his hands in his pockets. Naruto saw Sasuke smirk and knew that Sasuke was expecting an easy win, but that wouldn't happen. At Aruka's call of begin, Sasuke charged forward, using his family's interceptor style, with the intent to end the match quickly. As Sasuke threw his fist forward, Naruto leaned back and with a simple twist of his body, kicked Sasuke in the side of the head, knocking him out of the ring. Naruto merely put his hands back in his pockets, a calm expression still on his face. 
As the matches progressed, Naruto felt an urge to fight, not sure where it came from. Once the fights were over, Hiroka called them inside so as to finish the last part of the test, the portion. Classroom. Once everyone was seated, Hiroka began explaining the test. The last test is a simple one, merely create three clones and you pass. Naruto was starting to sweat, thinking, damn it, it had to be the one I suck at, didn't it, shit. Hinata saw Naruto's distress but could do nothing as she was called for the test next. Naruto was mentally cursing his bad luck and he saw that Sasuke had finished his test, a headband fastened, having a shit-eating grin on his face that made the fangirl swoon, idiots. Iruka saw Naruto's distress as well and was saying multiple apologies in his head over the bad luck but Mizuki picked the test so he could do nothing. He said, Naruto, it's time for you to take the test. Naruto got up and, as he walked down the stairs to the front of the class, he heard his classmates, especially Sakura and Ino, make fun of him, saying, that loser will never pass, he can't use that to save his hide. Naruto, ignoring all of the jabs, stood in front of Iruka and Mizuki and performed the needed hand signs. But before he used that, he felt his chakra drain, messing up his control, causing instead of three clones, there was one, and it looked half dead. This caused the class to laugh, while Hinata looked down sadly. Iruka said, I'm sorry Naruto, but you failed, and while your earlier performance was impressive, without a passing grade on this test, you won't have enough points to pass. I'm sorry. Naruto, now having an almost dead look in his eye, simply walked back to his seat, no one saying a single word. Iruka then said, congrats to all students who passed, please come back tomorrow to find out which team you will end up on. Until then, Jana. And with that, he performed the shunshin, body flicker, to leave the room. The rest of the class left soon after. Outside the academy. Naruto sat on the swing that was placed in the yard, watching, as his classmates were greeted with smiles and hugs from their parents. He watched with eyes filled with envy, as that was something he truly longed for, but never gained. He saw two of the women speaking, their expressions made what they were talking about all the more obvious. He sensed Mizuki's approach, but did not react until he spoke, Hey Naruto, I'm sorry about Aruka, he really wanted to see you pass, but there is a way to make it up. Naruto looked at Mizuki, already suspicious of the teacher's intention, but said nothing. Mizuki continued, There is a scroll in the Hokage Tower, if you find it, get it out of the tower, and can learn one from it, you can become a genin, good huh? Naruto, now fully aware of what Mizuki was saying, agreed, as well he saw the expression on the teacher's face was kind, he saw the malice in Mizuki's eyes. Deciding to play along, he said, what do I need to do? Mizuki smirked, handing Naruto a map of where he needed to go, saying, go to the library, take the scroll, and go to this location, I'll grade you when I get there. Naruto sped off to get ready, while Mizuki walked the other way, neither seeing the smirk the other had. Time skip, forest clearing. Naruto landed in the clearing, the old shack where it was supposed to be, and the forbidden scroll on his back. After removing it from his back, he rolled it out and saw the first. Shadow clones, damn more clones, wait, the shadow clone is more advanced, as it requires a large amount of chakra to use, and control is not really required, as the chakra for an individual clone is, as much, as the user puts into it, damn this clone technique fits me well. And it only needs a single hand sign. Perfect, I can use this. As he got to work with them, he noticed that he had none of the problems he had with a regular clone. Seeing that his progress was okay, Naruto went back to the scroll and unraveled it farther, but stopped at an odd seal. Looking it over, he saw a blood seal, a lesson he had stayed awake for during the academy. He bit his thumb and swiped it across the seal, allowing the contents to be revealed. What he had unsealed was another scroll, a little smaller than the forbidden scroll, and a letter. It seemed pretty old, but seeing as Naruto had plenty of time left, he opened the letter and read the contents. To the one who reads this. There is only one reason this letter is being read, and that is if someone of my blood found the seal and opened it. You may ask who I am, and there is only one answer, I am Kratos, son of the god Zeus and former god of war. I was once a Spartan general, feared for my tactics, but one day, I faced an army of barbarians and was nearly killed. But, as a last-ditch effort to save myself, I pleaded with Ares, the god of war, to save my life and destroy my enemies. In exchange, I vowed to serve him and fight in his name, and so, he gave me the Blades of Chaos, twin short swords that were to forever remain chained to my wrists. I followed Ares' orders, going after all the temples and followers of Athena, the goddess of WAR3, and Ares' sister. One day, I was ordered to attack a village, within it was a temple of Athena, but there was something in there, saying I never should enter it, but I did, and killed all that were inside. When the fog died out, I saw that my family, my wife and child, were slain, because of my foolishness. It was a trick by Ares, he did it so I could be a better warrior, but it didn't matter. 
I was cursed by the town's oracle to forever bear the mark of my sin, the ashes of my dead family stuck to my skin, never to be removed. For 10 years, I slaved as a champion for the gods, slaying beasts and taking down all threats to the world and Olympus, hoping to rid myself of the nightmares that plagued me. Until one day, I was ordered by Athena to save her city, Athens, from Ares. He was trying to destroy the city to prove himself better. My task was to kill the god of war. But to do so, I needed to obtain Pandora's box, which would give me the power to kill Ares. I was forced to go through the temple that was built to guard it, defeating all the traps that laid inside. As I reached the entrance to the temple, box in hand, Ares found out the plan, and with the skill of a god, he tossed a spear of rock, impaling me and killing me. Naruto was wide-eyed but continued to read, I fell down to the river Styx in the underworld, but I was not ready to die just yet, and so by a stroke of luck, I grabbed a ledge in the underworld and began to find a way out, upon doing so, I returned to Earth and faced Ares. Ultimately killing him. But the nightmares did not end, the gods broke their promise to me, and so I cast myself from the tallest cliff in Greece, hoping to end it. But the gods wouldn't allow it, and so I was saved and was given the title, God of War, as Ares's death left a spot on Olympus. But it would not last, soon, I was betrayed again by the gods on Olympus themselves. The Spartan army was attacking the city of Rhodes, and I went down to aid them to finish the city for the glory of Sparta. But the gods on Olympus had other plans, as Zeus, disguised as an owl, brought a statue in the city to life, a rather large statue. I faced a beast, and the battle raged across the city. But Zeus interfered, tricked me into draining my powers away into the Blade of Olympus, a sword that ended the war between the gods and titans. He told me if I did so, then my full power would be revealed, it was a lie. Draining my powers made me mortal again, and Zeus was able to kill me, using the blade. I once again was dragged into Hades, the hands of death pulling me down, but I was saved again, but not by a god, but a titan. I, titan of earth, healed my wound and reminded me of my heritage as a Spartan, as well as gave me aid in my quest for revenge. She led me to the sisters of fate, whose power I could use to go back in time to kill Zeus when he was vulnerable. I traversed the temple of the sisters, going to the island of creation, where there is Ided. I faced various heroes, such as Theseus and even Perseus, on my way to the sisters. But even the sisters themselves tried to stop me and they died, leaving the threads of fate for me to control. As I went back in time, I stopped Zeus from killing me and stole back the blade of Olympus. I fought Zeus and would have killed him had Athena not jumped in the way. Zeus escaped and with her dying breath, Athena told me that I was a son of Zeus and warned me not to kill him. I once again used the threads, but I went back further to the moment when Zeus used the blade to end the war. I took the titans back to my time and together we waged war on Olympus. As I rode on Gaia's back, we were attacked by Poseidon, he used his power over water to fight, and yet he still fell by my blade. When he died, the seas rose, now that their lord was no more. And this continued, Gaia climbed higher up Olympus, and we confronted Zeus, but was knocked straight back down the mountain. Gaia grabbed a ledge, but, as I held on, she revealed that I was merely a pawn in her own quest for revenge. With a tremor, I was knocked back all the way down to Hades once again. As I made my way through the river Styx, the ghouls that swam in it attacked me and robbed me of my powers. I was able to get to a shore where I ran into Athena, who was now on a higher plane of existence. She gave me the Blades of Exile in order for my revenge to succeed. I traveled through the underworld and killed Hades, god of the dead, and met a young girl named Pandora. She reminded me of my own daughter, but in order to reach the flame of Olympus, the source of Zeus's power, I needed her help. I made my way through Olympus, killing any god that got in my way, Hermes, the messenger, Helios, the sun god, Hera, queen of the gods, and even Hercules stood in my way. I killed all of them, and the world was thrown into deeper chaos. I finally reached the flame, and within it was Pandora's box, and after I put out the flame with Pandora's aid, the box was useless, or so I thought. I fought Zeus for the last time and killed him. But his fear caused me to hallucinate, and I lost the weapons I gained, except the blade of Olympus. I finally killed Zeus and the war was over, but it was hope, what remained at the bottom of the box, that saved me, and so I took the blade and released hope into the world. Then I disappeared, never to be seen again. Along with this letter is a scroll, within which I have sealed away the weapons I have collected throughout my journeys. But do not think you will just gain them, when you reach a level of power, the seal on each weapon will become available to you, and each seal is different. And while I may no longer be alive, by the time this is read, all you need in a near-death situation is call out my name and I will come to your aid, my descendant. May you go forth for the glory of Sparta. Kratos, ghost of Sparta, son of Zeus, and former god of war.
Naruto could not believe what he had read, he was related to God, and he had a scroll filled with his weapons, he quickly put the letter away. Remembering what was in his pouch, he pulled out a blank scroll, and while copying the blood seal, sealed away both scroll and letter. Not only five minutes after he put away the scroll, Iruka arrived in the clearing, a clearly pissed off expression on his face. Iruka said, what is wrong with you Naruto, why did you steal the forbidden scroll? Naruto merely sighed, his suspicion proven. Naruto said, so this wasn't a makeup test, I thought so. It seems Mizuki was after this scroll and used me to get it, isn't that right? Iruka merely heard the sound of kunai, and he and Naruto moved away as the kunai passed them. Mizuki stood on a tree branch, a sht eating grin on his face, a pair of shuriken on his back. He spoke up saying good job Naruto, now hand over the scroll and then you can become a genin. Naruto didn't even move or made any to give the scroll. Iruka was still going over what Naruto said, as if Naruto knew it was a trap and needed to prove it. Naruto stood up and Iruka screamed, don't give him the scroll, run away. Naruto turned his head in Iruka's direction, a cold look in his eyes. It put Iruka on edge to see it. Naruto turned back to the obvious traitor and heard him say, have you ever wondered why you were hated all these years? Why did the village see you as nothing more than a demon? Iruka, knowing where this was going, screamed, don't tell him, you know it's forbidden. Mizuki ignored the and said, 15 years ago, a demon attacked this village, the elders tell the children that the demon was killed, but that is a lie, the truth is, the demon, the Kaiubi no Kitsune, could not be killed, so instead, the fourth Hokage used it to seal it away inside you. You are the Kaiubi no Kitsune, you are the demon. Both looked at Naruto, one hoping for him to be alright, the other hoping for an emotional breakdown. When Mizuki saw Naruto standing, he then heard the most chilling thing, and because of what it was, but the tone behind it. And this is news how. I already knew of the fox, and if you are so foolish to believe I am it, you better be damn drunk or the world's biggest idiot. Iruka was trying and failing to hold back a laugh, and Naruto continued, but you are just as big a fool as he is, I wouldn't think of running, as that is the same as if I surrendered. And, as Naruto said in the next line, Iruka and Mizuki saw a translucent figure overlapping Naruto. It was a large figure, with ghostly white skin and red tribal tattoos spiraling on the body, twin blades stuck to his back. And Spartans, never surrender. Mizuki gained a little courage and started to laugh, nice little show you demon brat, but I guess you'll just have to die now. As he said this, Naruto merely stood in the same spot, his eyes unwavering, never showing emotion. Mizuki drew one of the shuriken off his back and started to spin it, ready to throw it at a moment's notice. Iruka was about to move to push Naruto out of the way as Mizuki tossed the buzzsaw ask blade, but Naruto moved first, shouting, shadow clone jutsu causing ten clones to appear, two grabbing Iruka and sling shooting him into the trees and out of the way. Mizuki, not expecting Naruto to learn the technique, was frozen as the rest of the clones and Naruto himself dogpiled him, each one laying a barrage of punches onto the was Iruka watched, amazed that Naruto had not only used clones successfully but was beating Mizuki. But it would not last, with a surge of strength, Mizuki pushed back the clones, dispelling them easily, while Naruto was blasted back. Mizuki then withdrew a vial of purple liquid and said, that's it, I will kill you both, and I will use the power Lord Orochimaru gave to me. Opping the cork, he quickly downed the contents of the vial and threw it down, breaking it. He started laughing insanely as a horrible transformation began to take place, giving him a more animalistic look. He grew a couple feet, his muscles began to grow rapidly, his skin started to be replaced with tiger fur, his nails became claws. When it was finished, he no longer looked human, more tiger than man. Mizuki then said, no one defeated me now, this power, it feels wonderful. Mizuki grinned at the frightful look in Aruka's eyes, but the grin fell into a scowl as he saw that Naruto still had the emotionless face as before, and so, he charged at Naruto with intent to kill him in one strike. Naruto, seeing this, was unable to move, unable to react, so he did the one thing he could, he reared his head back and shouted Kratos for all the heavens to hear. Time slowed down, at least, it looked that way to Naruto, till it came to a complete stop. There was a bright flash, and Naruto closed his eyes, unable to look into the bright light. When he opened them, he was not standing in the middle of a clearing, but a vast wasteland, surrounded by hellfire. In front of him, stood a very imposing figure. The man was easily six feet tall, his skin white as ash, with red tribal tattoos covering parts of his body, worn gloves covered his hands, and leg warmers attached to sandals, he wore chains, seemingly melded to his wrists, and from Naruto saw, the chains were connected to blades. Two short swords on the figure's back. Then the figure spoke, so, you are my descendant are you? State your name, young Spartan. 
Naruto, regaining his composure at the question, stated, I am Naruto Uzumaki, am I to assume that you are Kratos? The man, once known as the Ghost of Sparta, nodded, saying, You are the correct child, I see you are in need of my aid, and while I cannot give you aid in battle by fighting with you, I can give you a weapon to fight with. And so Kratos raised his hand, two harpies, servants of the former god of war, came forth, each carrying one of two blades. Kratos continued, saying, These blades were first given to me by Ares, the first god of war, and now I pass them on to you, child, but know this, if you accept these blades, the chains needed to use them will forever be melded to you, never to be removed. I gained two other sets of swords, which I sealed into the scroll. These blades, the blades of chaos, will guide you, as you unlock the rest, now, do you accept? Naruto did not even think, he didn't need to, and said, the power to protect what is dear to me, is worth any price, he held his arms outward, I am no stranger to pain, and I will not simply expect thing to be handed to me, so if I must work to gain power, it's all the better for me. Kratos smiled at the determination of the boy, and commanded the harpies to begin the process. The chain sprang forth, wrapping themselves around Naruto's arms, though to his credit, Kratos saw Naruto barely flinch at the hot metal, unlike himself who screamed in pain when the blades were given to him, all those years ago. Kratos saw Naruto inspecting the weapons, and said, those blades will grow stronger, as will you, but know this, Spartans never surrender, so long as they can hold a sword, they can fight, never stop, never look back, and fight like a true warrior. Naruto merely nodded, gripping the blades, showing he was ready. Kratos saw a bit of himself in Naruto, and said, now go, you have a fight to finish. Naruto then disappeared. Naruto soon found himself back in the clearing, Mizuki still in a rushing opposition, time still standing still, but was slowly getting back to normal. Mizuki stopped, seeing the blades in Naruto's hands, and laughed, saying, how pathetic, like those will do you any good. Naruto's face changed to an angry expression, stating in a voice that was clearly not his own, the hands of death could not hold me, the sisters of fate could not control me, and you will not see the end of this day. Mizuki charged once again, but Naruto, seeing a vision of Kratos using the blades, swung his arms in an arc, the chains pulling the blades with them, and Naruto saw the blades cut at Mizuki's neck, cutting off the head. Iruka could only watch, as his beloved student cut off Mizuki's head, gaining his first kill. But Naruto just kept a calm expression on his face, the blades back in his hands. Iruka wondered, is the fox in control? Naruto looked down at the head of Mizuki, and knew what happened. He then went to the nearest bush and emptied the contents of his stomach. Hiruka then called him over, saying, Naruto, I want to give you something, now close your eyes. Seeing Naruto do so, Hiruka took off Naruto's goggles and replaced them with his headband. Alright Naruto, you can open your eyes, Naruto does, congratulations, you graduate. The happy mood was ended by a squad of Anbu landing in the forest clearing. One of the Anbu, wearing an eagle mask, said, what happened here? Hiruka, now getting up, told the Anbu members what happened, Naruto merely looked up and said, I doubt we would need to tell the old man anything, as he must have seen it all in that globe of his, I saw it in his office once. The white-haired man was using it to spy on women. Everyone in the clearing, even Saratobi, who was watching from said globe, sweat dropped at the statement, while Saratobi thought, Jiraiya you ass. Hiruka, breaking out of the trance, said, Naruto, come to the academy tomorrow, so you can be placed on a team. Naruto nodded and walked home, the events of the day playing in his head the whole time. Council meetings and a sexy new sensei. Naruto arrived at his home, his ancestors scroll on his back, the blades of chaos sticking to his shoulders. After opening the door and walking inside, he placed the scroll down and decided to read it as he would need to understand how it worked. After opening it by using another blood seal, he saw a giant seal. It is compassed of four rings, set up in a ripple pattern, the ring in the center held one seal, while the others held four or five each. Underneath the large seal was a passage, it read. Like the rings of Pandora, a puzzle I had to complete, my weapons are sealed in a similar manner. The weapons I gained on my mission to kill Ares, lie in the outermost circle. The weapons I gained when I sought revenge on my father Zeus, lie inside the next circle. I sealed away the weapons I gained when I led the war against Olympus within the second innermost circle. But within the innermost circle, I sealed away the greatest weapon of all. The blade of Olympus itself. To reach the blade, you, my descendant, must prove yourself. You are able to access the first circle, but until you master each weapon within a circle, you cannot use the weapons within the next circle. The weapons are unique in themselves, as no matter how much you train with them, they will not grow stronger. What is needed to strengthen them is blood. They will absorb the blood that is shed when you kill an enemy. When the weapon begins to glow red, it is mastered. Do not waver in your resolve, as you are a Spartan, we do not give up. Naruto looked at the passage, as well as the scroll itself, in amazement. 
Taking the blades off his back, he saw that the blood that had coated them when he killed Mizuki was gone. He saw that the edges of the blades were a little sharper, the skull that served as the handguard had its teeth grown a little. So I have to kill people and let my weapons absorb the blood. I know that as a ninja I will have to kill, but how would I explain this to my teammates? Well, there's no turning back now, I'll just deal with it as it comes. He walked to his bedroom and then thought, how am I going to sleep if I have to wear the blades constantly? As soon as he thought that, the blades came off his shoulders and the chains seemingly vanished. He then noticed that there were chain-like tattoos on his arms and the blades had what looked like a place to attach the chains. So Kratos made some adjustments to the blades huh? From the way he looked, he must have had them on all the time. But the matter resolved, he went to sleep, doing so the moment his head hit the pillow. Naruto's Mindscape. Naruto soon opened his eyes, but when he did, he wasn't in his apartment. He found himself in a sort of sewer, with a maze of passageways and dim lighting. He said out loud, my mind is a damn sewer. This sucks. Seeing a passageway glowing brighter than the others, he figured, must be the Kaiubi, who else could it be? Walking down the hallway, he saw an entrance that was full white, the light blocking everything else in the room from being seen. As he stepped through, he was blinded, but when he entered the room itself and his eyes were normal again, he saw a room that could fit the Hokage monument with room to spare. It was easily the size of the monument height-wise, but the only thing in the room was a large gate. The gate itself was fairly plain, with an ornate design surrounding the frame, steel bars that looked like even Naruto couldn't get through. It was topped off with a paper seal stuck in the middle of the bars, acting as the lock for the cage. Naruto thought to himself, so this is the lair of the beast, wonder what it wants. He did not have to wait long for his answer, as a single red eye appeared, standing out against the darkness of the cage. So, it seems my jailer has finally paid his prisoner a visit, how unexpected. Said the fox. Are you surprised to see me? I thought you called me here, but it seems I was wrong, though I am wondering, if you didn't call me here, then who did? Said Naruto, confused clearly on his face. The voice rang out, and a glowing archway appeared on a wall in the room. I was the one who called you here, my descendant. Out of the archway stepped Kratos, and the fox shouted, You, the man who slaughtered men, women, demons, and gods alike, what purpose do you have in this child's mind? Kratos merely stared down the fox, as he did with so many beasts, and said, This child is my descendant, and I am here to give him a weapon I found in Hades, or, as it is called now, the Inferno. I believe this weapon will be useful to him. He then held out his hand, as if to grasp a staff, and a pillar of fire erupted from the ground, and when it lowered, Kratos was now holding, in a sense, the most beautiful or horrific scythe Naruto ever saw. The entire pole of the scythe resembled a human spine, the blade itself was double-sided, a longer blade facing the front of the weapon, while a shorter blade faced backwards. The front blade had two handles sticking out, allowing for easier use of the weapon close quarters. Naruto whistled, the weapon was excellent, and it certainly looked fierce. My, you have quite the eye for weapons huh? I wonder what this one is capable of. Kratos smirked slightly and said, why not try it? I myself never used a scythe, but the man I got this from had no need of it. Naruto reached for the weapon and, as soon as he touched it, memories that were not his own flooded his mind. They were of a man dressed in armor, wearing white clothes with a red cross on his chest. Naruto saw how effortlessly he wielded the scythe and Kratos stepped back, Kaiubi watching with interest. Naruto tested the scythe with a few swings and saw it stretched out. When Naruto swung it down, the blade moved to a stabbing position, changing it from a scythe to a spear. Getting an idea, Naruto thrusted the blade forward, the pole stretching as it impaled the wall. Naruto almost had a maniac grin at the versatility of the weapon as it covered many areas. Kratos said, this weapon will help you learn how to use a spear. It will be useful when you unlock some of my other weapons. It will fit in my scroll within the outermost ring. I trust you will use it properly. And with that, Kratos stepped back into the archway, a smirk never leaving his face. By the old gods, I never imagined my jailer was tied to that man, this makes this far more interesting. Perhaps I should slip into something more comfortable for you to speak with. Said the fox. It almost had a sultry sound to its voice. The outline of the fox shrank, taking on a more human appearance. The figure then stepped closer to the cage saying, I hope this form is more appealing to you. What Naruto saw had his jaw drop. It was a red-headed woman, with long slender legs, her hair reaching her butt. She wore a blood-red kimono with foxes imprinted on it. Her heart-shaped face showed her blood-red eyes, along with whisker marks similar to his own. Her mouth curved in a sensuous smirk. Seeing her container was speechless, she said, I guess you like what you see. My, to think the son of the man who sealed me would stand in awe at my beauty. Naruto picked up his jaw and said, My, it seems a lot of fools in this village are wrong. 
You make the second person who has done that. Ayubi's eyebrow rose, as she said, the second. What are you talking about? Naruto smirked and said, most guys in the elemental countries think women are weak, I would being a prime example. Everyone must have thought you were a guy, but the one woman every man is scared of is Tsunade of the Sanin. The fact that you are a girl just cements the idea that women can be as strong as men. Ayubi smiled at the obvious compliment. My, you know how to talk to women. But how would people mistake me for a guy? Naruto said, change your voice to that of your demon form and tell me. Ayubi did and said, I still don't see how, oh crap. Change his voice back I sound like a guy, I sounded like a guy. Naruto couldn't help but chuckle, but said, that's the problem. But anyway, it seems like morning is coming, and if I don't show up at the academy, well, I don't need to say it. He walked over to the cage and used one hand to pick up her chin and said, it must get lonely in here, if you ever need to see me for something or to do anything, I will gladly oblige you. Naruto then vanished from his mind, leaving Kaiubi to think, Dear sweet Kami-sama, I almost wanted him to stay for his offer, I hope it wasn't a joke. Naruto's apartment. Naruto woke up and heard a knocking sound from the door. Tense because people tried to attack him this way before, he called his blades to his hands, the chains reappearing on his forearms, one end of each connecting to the handle of the blades each. Keeping one blade at ready, he opened the door and saw an anbu keeling in front of his door. There wasn't anything unusual about the anbu, as Naruto had seen them in the village before. But the mask was blank, the only thing on it was the kanji for root painted on the forehead. Naruto said, what business do you have here, anbu? The anbu bowed his head and said, forgive me for disturbing you Naruto-sama, I was told to inform you that there will be a council meeting later today. You are to arrive at 2pm, no exceptions. Naruto immediately gained a scowl on his face at the mention of a council meeting, but said, I will be there and be sure to give Danzo my thanks for the warning. The Anbu froze at the name, but left quickly. Naruto looked at his clock and noticed he had an hour till class, he thought, now that I'm a shinobi, I won't have to settle with the civilian stores and I know just what I need to get. He went into his room, got dressed and headed out the door. He knew of a shinobi store that was close by. Takashi Weapon Shop. As Naruto approached the store, he saw a girl at least 16, a year older than himself. She wore green pants, a pink Chinese top, and her brown hair sported two neat buns. She was sweeping the front of the store and about to open it for the day. Naruto said, hey, is the shop open yet? The girl looked back and said, it is now, what's your name? I never saw you at the shop before. Naruto smirked and said, isn't it polite to give your own name before asking for someone else? The girl blushed but said, my name is Tenten, my father runs this shop, but why haven't I seen you here before? You are a ninja right? Naruto said, I became one yesterday, so I couldn't go into a shinobi store before then. I was stuck dealing with the civilian stores until I graduated. But now that I have, it's time to get out of this, he gestured his jumpsuit and into something more appropriate for my career. Tenten merely looked at the outfit and couldn't agree fast enough, and she said, good call, if you go on missions looking like that, you're a walking target. Naruto nodded and said, exactly, that's why I need to change this. Besides, I have my meeting with the sensei today, and I want to make a good impression, and nothing is better than showing your seriousness. Denton, who knew of Naruto from people talking about him during her stint at the academy, was surprised, as what she heard about him was proven false just by how he spoke. She heard he was a fool, a loudmouth, someone who would run out and do something stupid at a moment's notice. But the young man in front of her was calm, collected, and spoke like an educated adult. She then said, well, we can't stay out here all day, let's head in and get you what you need. The duo headed into the shop and immediately Naruto knew what to get. The store was lined with weapons, clothes, and all essentials a shinobi would need. Naruto grabbed clothes faster than Tenten had ever seen, even better than her teammate. She saw him rush into the changing room, so she waited. Ten minutes later. The curtain to the changing room was pulled back and Tenten's jaw could only drop at the sight. Naruto had completely dropped the color orange altogether, going with a short-sleeved coat, similar to the yandame, yet it was black with crimson red flames. He wore black pants that came down to just under his knees, his shins covered by shin guards, which were secured with chains. He went with black shinobi sandals to replace his previous blue ones. Under his coat he wore a fishnet shirt, which showed he was, in Tenten's opinion, ripped, the six-pack proving the point. He wore arm warmers on his forearm and black fingerless gloves. His ancestors scroll on his back, the blades at the ready at his shoulders. Breaking her out of her stupor, he said, exactly how much will this cost? Shaking her head, she replied, that would be 200 even. Naruto opened his wallet, stuffed with bills he thought he would need out of paranoia. Always getting overcharged sucked. 
After getting the appropriate amount of money, he laid it down and said, as fun as talking to a pretty girl like yourself is, I must get to the academy, can't be late. Tenten nodded her head, trying to hold down the blush which was quickly rising on her face. Naruto said, I'll be back later, as I will need more of the same outfits until then. He then left the store, Tenten quickly checked the receipt and gathered a few copies of the outfit so that Naruto would just need to pick them up and put them away. Ninja Academy Classroom. Everyone was excited to begin their careers, they spoke amongst friends, hoping to be on a team together. The Sasuke fan club was gossiping, each girl in it wanted to be alone with the last Uchiha. There was one girl who didn't look happy, seeing as the person she wanted to see wasn't here, meaning he didn't graduate. Hinata was depressed, as she didn't see Naruto, knowing he failed. The door to the classroom opened, and everyone's head turned to it, thinking they would see Ino and Sakura fighting again, but instead, they saw Naruto in his new attire, headband and all, causing several girls to blush and guys to become envious. Hinata cheered in her mind, happy she still had a chance to be on the same team as her crush. Kiba, the ever-present nuisance, spoke up saying, hey dead last, what the hell are you doing here, this class is for those of us who graduated, something you didn't do. Naruto thumbed his headband and said, your eyes must be as bad as your body odor, as I do have a headband, so I did graduate. Now if you'll excuse me, a lovely lady has been waiting for me, and it would be rude to keep her waiting. The classroom started to chuckle at Naruto's words to Kiba, and were surprised when Naruto started to walk over to Hinata. Said girl was blushing up a storm, still not used to hearing Naruto call her that. Kiba, as usual, did not like the fact Naruto was getting close to Hinata, then he saw the blades on Naruto's back and said, where the hell did you get those swords dead last? And what's with the scroll? Naruto was unable to speak, as the screeching duo, I mean Ino and Sakura, busted through the door, each of them shouting at the other. Naruto clutched at his ears, as his hearing was more sensitive than usual. Gotta ask Kentucky-chan about that later, but for now would you both shut up? He thought, then shouted, in order. Kami forbid, I think the people in Kiri heard you both. Sakura was the first to respond saying, shut up Naruto, at least we graduated, unlike you, so why the hell are you in here? This class is for those who passed idiots. Naruto was quickly losing his patience, but said, like I told Muttface, I did pass, I have the headband to prove it. Sakura scoffed and said, yeah right, I bet that's a fake, isn't that right Sasuke-kun? Just as the pink-haired banshee turned her head to face her crush, one of the blades slammed into the desk behind her, the fire around it was still there, but it was dying out already, the desk not even singed. She noticed her hair was cut slightly, and she saw a chain attached to the handle. She followed the chain back to Naruto and when she saw this, she screamed, what the hell Naruto Baka, are you trying to kill me? That was the idea, Dumbus, but it looks like my aim was off, guess I need to practice. Honesty, did you really think the way I acted was the real me? If so, you're dead wrong. The way I used to be was an act, a mask, to fool everyone into thinking I was weaker than I was, I proved it yesterday, and I can damn well do it right here, right now. Everyone's face held an expression of shock, anger, or happiness. Inada was happy that Naruto didn't like Sakura, Kiba was angry that Naruto looked cool doing it. A dark-haired girl in the back thought, Danzo-sama was right, Naruto-sama is certainly interesting. Sasuke, in all his idiocy, said, hand over those blades dead last, an Ichiha like me could use them better than you ever could. Naruto held a look of utter disgust, as he said, these are a family heirloom you filth, only those of my blood are able to use them, and even if I wanted to hand them over, and that is a non-existent if, I am unable to due to the fact that they are attached to me. He held up his arms, and everyone saw the chains connecting the blades to his arms, the arm warmers making it, so they didn't seem like it at first. But a close glance, it was easy to see. But, as always, Sakura still wanted to add her two cents. Stop lying dead last, now give those blades to Sasuke-kun, he needs them more than you. It was at that moment that Aruka entered the room, and he heard what Naruto said next. I could care less who it is, or what the demand is, if anyone dares to steal my family heirlooms from me, I will send you straight to the inferno. Aruka cleared his throat and said, Sakura, trying to take a clan heirloom is a serious crime, I would not try to press the issue, as Naruto is well within rights to carry out his threat. So now that we are done with that, I will proceed to the team arrangements. Squad 1, skipping the first 6, Squad 7, Sakura Haruno, Sasuke Ichiha, and Kiba Inuzuka. Your sensei is Kakashi Haddock. Sasuke didn't look like he gave a shit, Sakura was rubbing it in Ino's face, and Kiba was pissed because he had to be on a different team than Hinata. Aruka continued, saying, Squad 8 is Hinata Hayuga, Shino Aburam, and Saya. Your sensei is Kurana Yuhi. Hinata was sad she wasn't with her crush on the team, but was grateful that Kiba wasn't. She looked at the back of the class to see her teammate. 
Tsai wore mostly black, a short-sleeved shirt, a kadachi on her back, and what looked like a paint set with a few scrolls. The shirt came down to her midriff, black fingerless gloves, and she wore black shinobi pants. Her black hair came down to her shoulder. Tsai saw Hinata looking at her and gave a small smile, at least it looked that way. Hiruka continued, Squad 9 is still in circulation from last year, Squad 10 is Ino Yamanaka, Shikamaru Nara, and Choji Akimichi. Your sensei is Asuma Siratobi. Ino was depressed, Shikamaru didn't care, and Choji was still eating his food. Sakura saw that Naruto wasn't on a team, so she said, Hiruka sensei, what about Naruto Baka? He doesn't have a team. Hiruka sighed, knowing this was going to happen, and said, Naruto isn't on a team because his graduating offset the amount of genin, but he will still have a sensei. Naruto, he looks down at the name of the sensei Naruto has, and shudders, your sensei is Anko Midarashi. You will be working with Kurinai's team on all of their missions that are C-ranked, and over. Naruto sported a maniac grin on his face, creeping out some of the genin, the ones who fail, and Hinata was happy that she could still work with her crush. Saya was grinning, with her being on this team, Kiba would be unable to antagonize Naruto, and he would not deal with the Uchiha. Aruka said, Naruto, I honestly feel sorry for you. Anko is not the most stable of people. Naruto just grinned wider, his teeth showing to be sharper than normal, saying, oh, who says I'm not in the same boat as her? It's rude to judge someone based on their actions, I myself have proven that much. Aruka gulped and said, okay, your senseis will arrive shortly. I wish you all luck in your careers. He quickly ran out the room, shouting, thank Kami, I don't have to hear that damn Ichiha anymore. Naruto and the guys laughed as they realized the same thing. The large puff of smoke appeared in front of the classroom. A voice rang out, so which one of you brats is Naruto Uzumaki? The smoke cleared, showing a woman who looked 20 years of age, she had purple hair tied into a hairstyle similar to Shikamaru, with bangs held up by her headband. She wore a tan trench coat, an orange miniskirt that defined mini, and a fishnet shirt. The only other thing she wore was a sort of pendant. Naruto stood up and said, that would be me, so where shall we go? Banko raised an eyebrow as she knew her state of dress drew some heads, but Naruto didn't even look down, except for the fact he was standing in the upper rows. She thought, maybe he's not like the other guys in this village. Maybe. She quickly walked up the aisle, heading for the door saying, we're heading to the roof, come on. Naruto followed her out the door, but quickly turned to Squad 7 and said, I hope you brought a book to read, Haddock is always late by, oh what was it, oh yeah, two full hours, to everything. Bye. Naruto, still having a crazy grin on his face, closed the door behind him, leaving Squad 7 to wonder his meaning. Idiots. Academy Rooftop. Anko and Naruto made their way to the roof, Naruto walking behind her, and he was able to truly get a good look at his sensei. He saw that she was truly a beautiful woman. What idiot in this village wouldn't like her? Anko opened the door to the roof and sat down on a rail near the edge. She spoke up saying, we will get the intro out of the way. I'll start, my name is Anko Midarashi. My hobbies are hanging out with my friends, eating dango, and working as an interrogator. My dislikes are a certain snake, traitors, and some people in this village. My hobbies are the same as my likes, and my dream is to kill a certain snake. Naruto spoke up next, seeing as I'm a shinobi now, it's safe to tell you my real name. My name is Naruto Namikas. I like a few women in this village and a certain fox. My dislikes are pricks and conceited assholes. My hobbies are training and learning more about my family. My dream is to get revenge on the bastard that ruined my life, as well as others. That includes a certain snake fag. Anko was shocked at Naruto's name and when she heard that he also hated the same snake she did, her heart leaped. She then realized what was a part of his likes, a few women in this village, she asked, who exactly are these women? Naruto gave her a fox-like grin and said, oh you'll find out soon enough. Anko compassed herself and said, normally there would be a test, but seeing as we are a special case. We don't need to do one. Naruto said, good thing, as I'm guessing the test would involve me fighting you. Seeing her nod, then looking confused he took one of the blades off his back for her to see and said, these bad boys only have two settings, kill and maim horribly. Wouldn't want to cut up that pretty face of yours. Anko was at a loss for words, partly because of his words, but mostly because of the blades in question. Naruto spoke to her with a kind of playfulness, yet showed respect. He then said, don't get the wrong idea, you're for a reason, so you could kick my ass, and I did meet one of the strongest beings, and found out that a fox in the leaf was a woman. Anko thought, he met the fox, and the fox was a girl, well strike one for us. She then said, we'll start taking missions tomorrow, and I will not do any deer ranks, they suck. Naruto said, I agree, that shit civilians should do. Anko laughed and said, I'm beginning to like you kid, we're gonna get along just fine. 
Naruto left, saying, as he walked away, that's what I hope for, and I can see you hope for it, as well. We are connected by despair, and because of that, we need to support each other. Anko was moved, he knew about her, but he still treated her the same. Who are you, Naruto Namikas? Council Chambers, two hours later. It was 2 p.m., and Naruto was waiting outside the door to be let in. This better be good, I swear if those damn civilians try something I'll kill them myself. The Anbu standing guard said, you being called a kid, give them hell. Naruto smirked and said, oh I plan to. He walked in, the doors closing ominously behind him. The council seated in front of him. The council itself is divided into three parts, the first is the elder council, which was composed of the Hokage and his advisors. The second part was the shinobi council, which was made up of the clan heads of the village. The final and most irritating part of the council was the civilian council, made up of wealthy merchants and clan heads who didn't become shinobi. The pink spot of hair proves a point. Naruto stood in the middle of the room and saw a bandaged old man sitting with the civilians, his right eye was covered, he wore black robes, fit for a councilman, an X-shaped scar on his chin. This was Danzo. He and Naruto locked eyes for a moment and Naruto saw a little smile on his face, which was returned. Naruto had death scythe on his back, his blade sealed into the scroll, but the chains remained on his wrists. He then said, so what bullshit is the majority of the civilian council bitching about now? The shinobi council, the Hokage and Danzo had to hold their laughter in, but it was broken when Sakri Hirano, mother of the pink bitch, spoke up, watch your tone brat, we could have you killed for that. Naruto then said, how many times have you tried that, yet I'm still here. Why civilians need to be involved in shinobi affairs I'll never know. Tsuritobi spoke up saying, I agree, but on to the matter at hand, Naruto, you were found after killing a traitor to this village, but when we inspected the area, there was no blood to be found, care to explain. Naruto cleared his throat, as if to give a lecture, said, the weapons you no doubt saw in that globe of yours is the reason. No matter how hard I train, they won't get any stronger. They need blood to do so. The only weapon that doesn't need it is this scythe right here. My weapons will only absorb the blood of those I kill, and, as a shinobi, I will eventually take missions that will involve killing. It's a win-win. Sakriya shouted, hand over those weapons Brad. they belong to Sasuke-sama, not you. Naruto held his hands to his ears, as did the Inuzuka matriarch. Soon, a very fear-looking woman shouted back, will you ever shut up? Naruto, his hearing fine again, said, as I told your not-so-lovely daughter, these weapons are a family heirloom, and taking these gives me the right to kill you. He seals the scythe away, and he takes out the blades of chaos, do you want to try your luck? It will only benefit me in the end. One fat council member shouted, how dare you speak to us in such a way, as if you could kill us, you demon his words were cut off, as well as his head, as one of the blades were thrown right at his neck, it set aflame the entire time, allowing it to easily cut through the flesh. Naruto grinned and said, such a shame, he could have lived, had he not broken the law. The civilians were on the verge of pissing themselves, the shinobi were glad the Achiha were gone, as Hugaku would have demanded Naruto to hand over the blades, as well. Saratobi was thinking, he's strong enough, now I can't hide it anymore. He then said, Naruto, it's time we got to the real reason this meeting was called. It pertains to your heritage. I didn't tell you because it was a request of your father. But seeing as you are capable of defending yourself, I can. Naruto could only give a dark grin, seeing as the civilians would be shitting themselves after this, the Hokage and Shinobi Council sharing his thoughts. Tsuritobi continued, Naruto, your father is none other than our own fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze, the Yellow Flash. Your mother was Kashina Uzumaki, the Red Death. She originally wasn't from this village, but when her home village was destroyed, she came here, and I doubt I need to say what happened after she met your father. There was a large thump, and when Naruto looked to his left, he saw all the civilians except Danzo passed out, and everyone conscious had the same thought, what a bunch of losers. Tsuritobi continued, Naruto, this means that now you are under the craw and thus are required to have five wives, as a minimum. This must happen before you turn 18, is that understood? Naruto said, yes, I understand. Tsuritobi then said, then this meeting is concluded. You are all dismissed. Naruto walked out into the hallway when he was stopped by Tsum. She said, I heard what Kiba did yesterday and today, and I would like to formally apologize for it. Naruto calmly said, there is no need for an apology, though I would recommend teaching Kiba some manners in regards to dealing with women, as his actions will get him killed one day. Or worse. Tsum, while not being a man herself, knew what men considered worse than death. She merely said, I will see to it. It seems you have more business to deal with. She then used Shunshin to disappear. Naruto turned behind him and saw Saya waiting for him. She said, Danzo-sama wishes to speak with you Naruto-kun, I'm here to take you to him. 
Naruto nodded, and Saya placed a hand on his shoulder, using Shunshin. Read headquarters. Naruto entered the room, Danzo sitting calmly in a chair. When he noticed Naruto was in the room, he smiled and said, so good of you to come. I have to say you gave a good performance at the meeting. Naruto grinned, saying, but of course, I have to thank you for sending the Anbu to tell me of the meeting. I never would have been prepared if it happened suddenly. Anzo quickly became serious, saying, we were able to find your mother, she was locked in the secret area of the hospital, in a room the elders wanted no doctors or nurses to enter. She is in a coma, and thankfully my root Anbu were able to get her out safely, if we hadn't, she would still be stuck in that room, forever in a coma. She has been recovering, but she won't wake up for a couple more weeks. Naruto was thanking all deities for this. He said, that is great to hear. Those elder bastards have messed with my life, along with the civilians, for the last time. They both will suffer for this. Saya placed a comforting hand on Naruto's shoulder, and Danzo said, they will in time, as will Madara and Orochimaru. I will help you make sure of it. Naruto smirked, saying, I see, I am grateful that Kiba is not on Hinata-chan's team. I believe you had a hand in that. Anzo said, yes, I had Saya-chan here placed on the team so as to prevent the Inuzuka boy from raping her, as his file stated he would if he had the chance. Naruto's smirk grew wider, and he said, times are changing for the leaf, and it will be good ones. Naruto and Danzo started laughing, Saya merely standing back, eyeing Naruto with a blush on her face. Thanks for watching my video. See you next time, till then sayonara.